Okay, mystery of the word. It's, uh, as you know, probably if from the last six plus years I've been here, uh, one of my passions is what we call expository teaching. When you take a bi book of the Bible and just go through it, and you, uh, we teach, as Paul says, at one, uh, yeah, Paul, as Paul says at one time, the whole counsel of God. That's in the book of, of Acts. And um, every fall, I'm trying to actually remind ourselves, why are we here? And we have this series on, on our vision or mission or whatever you want to call it. And we just remind ourselves, what do we want to be as a church? And the first, uh, uh, first message in this series was about the fact that we are called to belong. The church is, should be at least, a place where those who walk through these doors feel that they belong. And not because they match a certain um, look outlook of how Christian ought to be. But the fact is the church should be a place where the broken, the suffering, those who struggle should know that they belong. And just going to uh, share with you one small thing. It goes against what I learned last night in, in school. I was in school two days, uh, last two days, uh, about not sharing too much about yourself. But this is part of who we are as a family. So if you go back with me in time to the fall or the summer of 2017, when I first came here, it was new. And this church, I was new as a senior pastor in Canada. And you guys welcomed me, Anna, and the kids with, with a love I've rarely seen in my life. And it was awesome because it was a time in our lives when we were not at our I'll say we're struggling, you know, as a family. And uh, the love we received from you felt made, made us know, not just feel or feel and know that we belong. I got a letter, actually a handwritten letter at Christmas that year with, you know, amongst many other things. I mean, just this word, this words stuck with me and will probably stick with me forever is this. You, you, you as a family, you, the Kachulas, you made us feel like a family again. And it was not because I, ha I came with this amazing teachings, although I do hope I, I'm a decent preacher uh, and I'm still growing. It wasn't because I had, you know, amazing gifts in this or that. It was because we could be broken together. I was here as I was, you know, with, the re you know, with who, you know, just me, no mask, no pretense, just me. And I loved you and you loved me back. That's the meaning of belonging. When you come as you are, and then you go to second step, which is grow, which means a challenge to grow. You know, if we know that something needs to change, we don't just hide it to be nice and not hurt somebody's feelings. We challenge each other in love and hum humbleness, humility, humility to grow. And we also provide an environment we, we, where you can grow. You know, you, we don't come to Sunday mornings because we, we, we have to. We don't go to small groups because we have to. We go because we want to place ourselves in, a, in an environment where the Lord can speak to us, whether it's through our brothers and sisters, through the scriptures, through whatever. That's why we come to church, because we want to be in a place where God can speak to us. Now, I'm not saying that God cannot speak to us Monday to Saturday. He does and he will, but he chose the church as the body of Christ as a place where we belong and we grow as we serve, teach, encourage one another. We live life together. You know, those one another's uh, uh, from the New Testament are very important for us. But there's not, that's, that's not the last thing. The last thing is this. We're here because God has saved us for a purpose. And the purpose is to serve his kingdom. You know, as we see on the, on the, on the wall and behind me also, we want to be a place where you belong. We want to be a place where you grow. But also we want, to play, we want to be a place where you serve as, or as you see on the screen, a place where you find your purpose. And that's, that's a struggle many of us face. I'm not sure, I'm not, I wouldn't say everybody, but a lot of us face this struggle, which is what is my purpose? What am I here for? You know, when I was, you know, young and restless, you know, many, many moons ago, uh, when I did not know Christ, I was, I, life was great. If you know, if what I mean, it's, there was no highs, no lows. I was okay. Doing, I was doing, living an okay life, but nothing really made sense that I, this is worth dying for. This is worth living for. And I was, I was almost on the, press, on the border, border, border of depression just because nothing made sense. Nothing, was, nothing had taste. And then one summer, actually it was a spring of, of 93, in May of 93, I met the first real Christians. And I saw their lives. I saw their joy and their hope. And the fact that they, they seem to have 
a purpose to live for. And that made me jealous. And I was, before I was empty and disoriented and I could find no satisfaction. Sorry, all those things come to mind. It's actually my notes, I'm not making this up. And then I met Christ and everything changed. I realized that I matter. If someone chose to die for me, that means my life matters. You know, when you hear Christ died for the world, it's something so general, so vague. But when you realize the Lord, our God, sent his son to die for me, that means I matter. That means I have a place where I belong. That means I have a mission. That means I have something to contribute. And that was the beginning of a, an amazing journey with God for me, where I learned these this words. Oh, um, Vinicio, please. I learned these words, you know, from Ephesians. I was, uh, I was a brand new pastor. It was, uh, uh, this, actually, it was January of 1999. It was 11th of January, January 11th, 1999. I remember the day. I was on something called uh, Yahoo Chat. It was something old, you know, Messenger, Yahoo Messenger Chat, something right back in the day, if you, if you remember those days. And I was in the chat room of Christians, and I, I asked for prayer because I was, I was a new pastor. It was this very small church, about 17 people and all young. And I, I, did, I had no clue what I had to do. I was clueless, you know. And the Lord gave me through a, a, a person in that small group, a chat thingy, chat room, this verse, you know. I am here to serve in this way for the perfection of the saints, for the work of ministry. And that became my life verse. I had a reason to live. I have a way. I knew clearly how God wanted me to serve. I have a reason. I found my purpose. And of course, this is not just for me, because as you see on the screen, it is this, this, ver- this words in Corinthians, just like a, like, a, like a light that just shines for me. They say to each, which means each. Rudy, that includes you. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Everyone has something to contribute. No, nobody is useless in God's kingdom, you know. And as I began my ministry back then, I was excited but scared at the same time. And you know what? It was a normal, I don't know, anxiety. If, I, if there's anything like a good anxiety, you know, I, maybe it's a different word. I, can, I should use it here, but anyway. It was a normal feeling before anything that, any task that is above and beyond your human powers, and leading a church, believe me, it is, it is above and beyond my human powers. And that's where I le- realized that the Lord does specialize in using people who feel weak in themselves to show himself great. And that is the reason the church is a place where you belong, you grow, and you serve. Because God saved you. God saves you for a purpose. Not just because you need clean clean life from your past sins not just because you want a life in heaven but because here and now until we get to see him face to face you have a purpose we have a reason to be here we have a ministry before us but what is the problem why why isn't this just normal and and just uh, uh, say something that we can see in us and everyone around us uh, in the daily life because we do face a struggle and the problem or the struggle is the fact that we, it's hard to find that meaning and purpose sometimes. And because the world has this, this noise around us, this, all these flashing lights and noises that confuse us sometimes and just take, our, take us away from the path that we should, we should be on. Honestly, I can say it's not easy to know your purpose and your, your, your meaning of, of being here. And it's a struggle sometimes. Why? Because there's this identity crisis. We ask this question, who am I? And we used to define this through the scriptures, you know, we as in society. The Bible defined us who we are. We knew we are made in God's creation, made, made, made in God's image. We are, you know, all the things that come from the Bible. The verse that Vinicius read, Ephesians uh, um, 2.10, made for a purpose, made to serve God. We knew who we are. But once we decide, society pushed the Bible away, There was no real way to define who we are. And it became this crisis of identity when when we tried to to redefine man's identity separate from the creator's uh, definition. And that leads to this 
confusion that we see around us and to this sense of purposelessness, purposelessness. Man, that's a fancy word, purposelessness. Just rolls. That's the coffee speaking right now. But it's not just this question, who am I, that is confusing us. It's also the question, why am I here for? And the world has its own definition that does not include God. We are here for personal happiness and success. That is the definition of the world. We're here to be happy, to have success. It's a self-centered life or pursuit. And the search of fulfillment in this way can only have one end, which is empty and void. The search of why am I here for, if you try the, the, way, the way it were, in the end, it leaves you empty. Just like I think it was Alexander the Great, when he was, he conquered probably the greatest empire of the world, besides the Babylonians, I think. Anyway, huge empire from India to Europe. And when he was buried, he was buried with one hand outside the tomb. If it was not Alexander, please, somebody Google and correct me if it wasn't Alexander. And the, the meaning of this was, I take nothing with me in the grave, you know? But we still try that way. We, we put hours and hours and hours in, in, in work and one job, two jobs. We push our kids to have school, extracurriculars and um, this and that. And in the end, you know, one thing we struggled back at Grace Church in Newmarket was parents chose hockey over church. They chose to, I mean, to send their kids to, to hockey on Sunday mornings or Wednesday nights instead of going to church. And the message was this, was, what was the message for the kids? Hockey is my, my father's God. You know, it was not the intended message, definitely not. The guys that, I mean, we're talking about good families, families with, you know, that would always proclaim Christianity and read the Bible and whatever. But in the end, if it were to choose between hockey or, uh, or church, they would always choose hockey. Even though, what's the percentage? 0.001 of kids actually make it to any professional leagues. <laughs> we still want to be there. I don't play hockey anyway. A third question is this, where is everybody? Where is everybody? Especially in Toronto. If you live in Toronto, it's, it's so, hard, so easy to be lonely, even though you're surrounded by, by tens of thousands of people. It's so easy to be lonely because we are interconnected. You know, I have almost 1,400 friends on Facebook, 13-something, you know? But, it, you know, you know when you have those jars of pens that you keep on your desk, you know, have like a thousand pens in one jar? Same with Facebook friends. You know, you have a thousand, but only two right. You know, or continuously fooled by this idea that we are connected, whether it's Instagram or Facebook, whatever, but we're actually more and more isolated. And that's why I told you in the first ser series of this message, of these messages, uh, you know, the application was, was three things, remember? It's like a movie. Who remembers the three things? Eat, pray, love. Eat together. Challenge, I challenged you, and I still will challenge you, on a Sunday after church, look around and ask God and ask somebody, would you like to go to lunch with me today? And don't think fancy foods, just spaghetti and meatballs, it's fun. I mean, it's for me at least, I don't know. But something cheap, but because the the... The food is the least important part, is the fellowship, being together, breaking bread, sharing stories, laughing together, and then doing the second thing, which is pray for one another. You know, if, if, if let's see, if uh, Jack, which is one of the elders, which I meet with him quite often, if, I, if, he, if he asked me today, how do you pray for Jack, for his life? I was like, um, I pray for Lillian and I was like, I, was, I would struggle because I actually don't spend that much time with Jack when I ask him to ask him that, Jack, how are you? And maybe I should, maybe, it's, maybe I shouldn't say this. I don't know. Jack, we'll need to schedule some lunch together soon. You know, but if, if, if I as a pastor struggle with, for example, with one of our elders to know more about his life at home, how about you guys? You know, so eat together, pray together, and then I, I use the word love because it just rolls off easily, but it was love practically. Remember, if you remember that, uh, that sermon two weeks ago? Love practically. Serve one another. Just, just be in each other's lives to, to you know, plug, uh, 
a PC back in the in the wall, you know, like for Rudy, or uh, I don't know, just scare some furniture for 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 Vinicio or whatever else is that's that's love. Anyway, so fight against loneliness and isolation because in this world we have lost our sense of community, and the church should be different. The church should be a place where you know you belong, and you're together with others. And you, when you ask where is everybody, you say it's right here. It's these people, it's my family on, on, let's say, Wednesday nights for prayer or um, you know, Saturday night for Bible study. It's, I, I have my family. The third, fourth question is, where am I going? What's my direction of life? You know, when you, you don't know who you are, you don't know what you're here for, you don't know what your gifts are, then it's hard to ask them this question, am I, where am I going? In the absence of understanding of one's gifts, and, the, and one's calling leads many to this feeling of being adrift, of being purposeless. And the church should be the family that God gives you to find this idea of how oh, I'm going this way. I'm going that way. God, Lord is calling me, so I get to help going this way or that way. Now, of course, the last one here is, I think that's, that sounds familiar from somewhere. I, I wrote it down as a good question from, from my brain, but it feels familiar from something. Oh God, where art thou? It's probably from a psalm in King James, I would assume. Dominic, I'm oh, sorry, that's Romanian. Lord, where are you? There is a spiritual drought. And some of us go through that, even maybe today, when you ask, Lord, where are you? I'm asking for you, I'm praying to you, I don't feel you, I don't know, I, it's, I, it's like you're gone. And you, we let our feelings r- rule us. We feel distance, but we forget our theology in that moment. We forget our, the, our teaching that God is with us, God is with us, it's a promise. Because we feel unable to discern God's plans, we feel that we're just abandoned. But maybe it's because we, we haven't asked our question of how am I, why am I here no. What are my gifts? What can I offer? Who are my connections? What is my family? What is my role or purpose for being here? Who am I? You know, God is here. God is near. God is with us. The problem is most like, like I said before, is that, that noise that we, that just makes us conf- confused. Those flashing lights around us that just allow, I mean, I'll say, they, they push us to miss the obvious signs that God has for us. So, what do we do? How do we discover a place to serve? How do we get to know what is our, our, our purpose personally? You know, how do we serve? Some, some of you probably asked this question, okay, so what do I do now? You know, remember the, uh, the old uh, Jungle Book, what do we do now, you know? First thing is clear, look up. It's, it's, it, it has to start with this. Look up to discover God's will for you because it is, there is a will of God for us. That verse in Proverbs is so strong when you ask, what, why am I here for? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on, on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight or make straight your paths. You know, see God in prayer, in meditation, Try to discern, you know, if you cannot, just go with others. Ask someone, hey, can we pray about this together? I need to know, you know, I need to look up to God and find out from him, what is my place to serve? How do I find my purpose? So seek God in prayer and meditation uh, to try to discern your, your purpose, whether it's individual or collective as a church, your purpose in, in this family, in your home family, in, in maybe in the city, on the, in this world. It has to start with God. Don't Google or don't ask chat AI or whatever, you know, other methods, you know, ask God. And it may not come overnight. The answer may not come, you know, in a flash or whatever, but persistently ask God. Pray until something happens. Pray until you hear God's voice. But if you don't, I'm going back back to a good Canadian that wrote this book uh, called Experiencing God. He said, if you don't hear God's voice, if you don't know what to do, look around, open your eyes and ask, ask yourself or ask others, where is God working right now? And join that place. You may not know your, I'm actually 
cutting in through the next, uh, next, actually let's go to the next, actually it's part of this. When you look up, that's the first thing you pray, God, where do you want me? I'm here because I belong in this family. You made me feel and know that I'm here to receive and to give. I'm here to be blessed and to bless others. I belong here. And it challenged me to grow. You put me into this Bible study. You gave me a Bible. You gave me teachers, mentors, friends. I grow. They show me what I need to change. I show them what they need to change, you know, with love and humility, and we grow together. But now we serve. How do I serve? And you ask, but I, can, I have nothing to offer. And I go back to Corinthians. Now there is a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. And there's a list there going on, but it says in the end, to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. There are spiritual gifts. There are talents. There are passions. I don't think I have the spiritual gift of photography. I don't think there even is a such a thing. But I enjoy taking photos. And you know what? It's a great door for ministry. I do believe God has called me to teach. Because if you have seen me like 20 years, 25 years ago, you'd be like, what is he doing there? You know, but God has changed me and God has used me to grow. And God placed people in my life that have shaped me into who I am today. If you don't like it, I'm going to just blame them. So let, give me a list of those who changed me. So like, you can blame them, not me. That was a joke. What are your talents, your gifts, spiritual gifts, and your passions? How do we discern this? You know, where there is assessments, there are some questionnaires or whatever they call them to find out what your gifts are. There is mentorship, which I believe is probably even more effective. When you work with someone, pray with someone, live, do life with someone that can guide you towards what is obvious to others, not maybe not for you as your gifts. And even do apprenticeship. When you, you get, engaged, get involved in something and you have someone to help you as you actually do stuff. But again, the point is, be active. You know, don't do like this. Sorry, some of you, some of you guys do that. Some, no, no, uh, no. Don't. I'm going to wait and do nothing until God shows you what my gifts are. I'm going to wait a year, two, 10, 20, whatever it takes. I'm going to wait until God shows me. Don't do that. Do whatever it takes. I think I said this before, but because it fits now, I'm going to repeat it. So blame it on age. When I began ministry back in uh, at Open Heaven Church in Bucharest, which is before, no, that was actually a mustard seed church, I did everything that was needed. I did summer camps for youth. I did, I, I opened services and prayers. I washed floors. I watched kids. I preached once in a blue moon. I did everything that was available because I loved that church so much that whatever was needed, I did it. And as I did this, people said, do you think you should sing on a Sunday? Or I knew that watching kids for one Sunday taught me what the migraine was. So I thought I knew that, you know, watching kids is not my gift. But then people said, you know, the way you described that thing from the Bible last week was awesome. Could you do it again? And sometimes, for example, others see, saw something in me. I was doing translation for Pastor Lou back in Romania. And um, I was not seeing myself as a teacher. But Lou, Pastor Lou said, I want you to teach. I thought, okay, next year, you know, a couple of years, sometimes. Yeah, for sure. Okay, tomorrow. Take Judges, Ruth, Samuel, and Kings. That was my allotment, you know? And he just pushed me. I mean, like, he just threw me to the deep end. You know what? I loved it. I thought I was unable to be a teacher, or I didn't know, I you know, I was like, how can I teach others? But the, when I did it, I was scared but excited and God worked. So anyway, look, at, look up. Ah, oh, come on. Look up, ask God, Lord, where do you want me? If you, if, you, if you need me, just ask with others together, pray with me, where does God want me? And then look inside, look into your heart. What is God giving me as a gift, as a passion, as a talent? And ask God, how can I use this for him? Or if, if you think you have no gifts, no passions, no talents, Ask someone, okay, I'm here, I'm available. Ask me to do anything, and I'll try my best to do it. But be active. Do things for the Lord, wherever there's a need. Don't ask. Don't wait. Be involved. And then, of course, look around. I love this verse from Peter, 1 Peter. As each has received a gift. You see this, Rudy? As each has received a gift. So 
by the way, I'm not making fun of Rudy. We have a good friendship going on, and I'm, I'm trying to encourage him actively to, to know that God has a plan for himself, for him too. So this is just a, a very good friendship going on. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's ver varied grace, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Again, I say, look around. Look for opportunities. Don't, I mean, I know that in some cultures, you wait until the boss says, do this, or the pastor says, do that. And I will. And don't say, I didn't, you know, you, to some of you, you asked me to ask you, and I will. So don't come back to me and say, why do you say this? You told me to ask you directly. To others, I will probably be more, or actually less assertive. I'll be like, hey, would be nice if somebody would, whatever, I'm, I'm just kidding right now. In this group, as you see, we have Romanians, Chinese, uh, Dutch, um, Canadians, um, uh, what am I, uh, I say Nigerians, I say Nigerians already, Nigerians, Jamaicans, uh, trying to Guyana, is it British Guyana? No, just Guyana. You know, so diverse, and the cultures are diverse, and I know that uh, Canadians probably like leadership to be less assertive, like just to suggest things, and then hopefully someone will, will chip in. But uh, I know that the Asian cultures are a bit more, they need assertive leadership, um, or they're used, or like they're used to assertive leadership. And I want to be like Paul, to the Greek, I'll be the Greek, and to the Jew, I'll be the Jew. But just to make sure that everyone knows there is place, there's opportunities for everyone to serve. Look around, look for opportunities, and actively get engaged. To, I mean, get involved, not engaged. I mean, some of you probably need to get engaged too, but get involved. Serving, no, that's, I'm, I'm jumping. Uh, because there is something unique that you and only you can offer to the body of Christ. And then, of course, the last one is look outside. Yes, we love the body of Christ. We love our family and we want to serve our family. But there's so much need out there. Whether it's this, uh, uh, the world close by, you know, Toronto or, um, you know, Ontario or Canada, whether it's the world outside our home country or other countries God has put on our hearts, look outside. Not just hear us, the, the, the holy club, we get together here, it's awesome to be as Christians, we eat together, we serve one another, we love one another, it's an awesome club. We're not the club, we're God's lighthouse, we're a mission place where God trains us to send us out. You're here not because it's awesome to be here together, which is, it is awesome, but they're here because we want to be uh, redeemed, restored, trained, and sent. Redeemed from all your past sins and failures, restored to where God wants you. And whatever I said before, challenge and sent, I forgot what I said. <laughs> it's not in my notes, so I should probably not go on a, on a tangent here. But God wants you to not just care for you, care for those in your family, but also look outside where the need is so great. We have the great commandment. When I told you, I, I, I came out from that vision and mission movement of the 90s and 2000s with this conviction. The church has one clear God-given uh, vision, to love God and to love people. And our mission is simple, make disciples. I, I don't wanna, yeah, we, we go to belong, grow, serve because it, make, how it makes things more tangible, but our mission is clear, or sorry, our vision is here. You shall love, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Our primary purpose as a church in, in our lives here is to love God and love others. So how do we do this? Well, we can probably go into more detail about how to serve outside the church, but remember that serving and caring is, is an amazing way to find and fulfill one's purpose. Maybe I can, I can tell you, come with me to Thunder Bay. I'm gonna teach a men's conference in March next year. My first time ever I'm asked, I've been asked to teach a men's conference, so I hope I'll do a good, decent job. But I probably, I would love to go with someone. I'm going to, by God's grace, if the elders approve our budget, I'll, I'll I'm, my budget, not yours, mine. Uh, I want to go to Moldova. And you know I'm passionate for Moldova. But I, I'm, I'm the only one, me and Pastor Nick, that is not here with us anymore. He went to a better place. Just kidding. That was a joke. Uh, it's just me that knows how Moldova feels firsthand. Join me. 
Come with me uh, to the summer camp next summer if I can make it. Uh, I'm not sure if it's on a schedule or not, but uh, I, I'm definitely going to teach, or not teach, but uh, run a pastor's retreat up north in Thunder Bay. Come with me. Wash dishes with me. You know, just do work for it to, to allow pastors and their families to, to just have a time of like, what's how you call this in English? Respite, I think is the word in English. You know, there are so many opportunities to, if you don't know what or don't know how, ask me. I'm, you know, I have this friend that has this, uh, this, uh, this amazing statement. God, Pastor Russ, he was here a couple of times. God has a plan for our life. Let me tell you what the plan is. You know, that's not truly Canadian, you know, it's not in our spirit, but it's, it's you know, we can do this as pastors. We're, we're equipped and, and passionate to tell you. You know, how do we see God using you? And you can say no, of course. And you can say, oh, no, but I think it's different. But we can go back and forth. But in the end, is, the point is, you will be encouraged and challenged to serve. And the Great Commission is, like I said, make disciples. Yeah, it's long. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations and so on and so forth. But the point is, like I said, is make disciples. Which here, which one? I'm not going to do a show of hands. I have this question. So ask, okay, I'm asking you to ask God a question. Do I make disciples? Am I somebody's disciple? Because you can go both ways. You can say, Lord, I need someone to train or disciple me. And then if you don't know whom, just ask me and I'll try to make some connections. Or maybe say, it's time. God has given me so much. Maybe it's time to pay it forward and start actually obeying God and make disciples. We're a church that will push you challenge you, encourage you to live out your purpose and serve. And one, one element is, one big element is make disciples. And don't think it's just for some, for the elect. Again, it's for all of us. Engage, this is a key word, key word, you know, engage in ministry, engage in missions, engage in outreach, both locally here, both or globally, if you want to uh, come with me anywhere where God is opening a door for me, but pray for God to help you and also to use you and to fulfill the Great Commission and to find your purpose in sharing the gospel. Let's finish this with, the, this is the last page in my notes and in my PowerPoint, so let's make this personal. How do we apply this now? When we leave this place today, what's in this for me? Well, one thing is clear, it's not about trying harder. It's not to say, I need to try harder to be, you know, to fulfill God's commitment, commission to do, it's not about trying harder, it's, to, it's about resting in Christ. It's about going to Jesus and ask him, what do you want me to do? And when you find that thing, when God speaks to you that way, you'll know that it's not work, although it may be tiring. It's, it's just passion, lived out passion. And it's not, about, not, it's not just for those who are amazingly courageous, you know, brave and whatever. What was the biggest or the most often repeated commandment to Joshua? both in Joshua 1 and again in, I forgot, Joshua, I forgot, I think it's Joshua 8. Joshua 1 and Joshua 8. God used, God spoke to Joshua directly, and then the people spoke to Joshua twice. What was the biggest command or encouragement for Joshua? Do not fear, do not be afraid. Exactly, because moving on into the promised land was scary. He, did, he, never, he never waged that kind of a war before. It was something that he knew in the past people ran away from. He never tested his leadership before he was under Moses. So with Moses, maybe things went well. well who am I to fill in his shoes? So Joshua had this amazing words from God and the people. Do not be courageous. Sorry. <laughs> Do not be afraid. Be courageous. Sorry. Um, this, is, this is me. If you know me, this is typically me. Do not be afraid, be courageous, because there's always this amazing mix of excitement and fear before you engage in a task that is above your own power. And it's, it's a great place to be both excited and fearful, because if you have, you have passion and then you depend on God, the excitement means I want to do this. I want to do something. And the fear means it's not my power. It's God's power at work in me. And that is the good news for today. The Lord specializes in using people who feel weak in themselves to show his greatness. 
You don't have to be perfect. We don't have to be perfect to be engaged. We just need to be available. And God can transform you. You may say today, I am useless. You know how God sees you? God sees you as useful. There was an amazing phrase in the book of Philemon. When Paul writes this, uh, to this man about a slave, Onesimus. And Onesimus, the name means useful. And Paul writes these words. You know he was useless to you before, but now he's Onesimus. He is useful to you. That's the gospel. Look in the mirror and say, who am I? The answer is, don't matter. Ask yourself who God is. When Moses said to God, but who am I, Lord? You know what God responded? But I am. But I am with you. It doesn't matter who you are that much as you, as you think. It matters who God is, and God is on your side. He has redeemed us through Christ, and has redeemed us for a purpose. The gospel is teaching us that we are made for God, sorry, by God for a purpose, but then our sin did separate us from us. And that's why Christ's sacrifice means so much. When at the cross, he gave us redemption for our past sins. He gave us reconciliation with our creator, but he also saved us for an amazing ministry. Read Ephesians, take notes, read Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. Made for a purpose, made for good works, actually it says there. God has saved us by grace and faith for good works. For all have sinned and fell, fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift to so redemption in, as is in Christ Jesus. That's Romans 3. 23 and 24. The sin stops us from knowing what our purpose is. But God's grace saves us, both from our past, both for an amazing future, but also for today, to have a purpose today. And the church, even this church today, becomes the place where we can discover our gifts, this life-changing truth that God saved us from our past for a purpose. And we're challenged here and encouraged to find what is our purpose in Christ. And it's okay, again, I say, to be excited but scared at the same time. Because when God calls us, when God challenges us to something new, that's the best place to be. Passionate but dependent on the Almighty. That keeps us humble and centered on Christ Jesus. And with this, I finish again. I finish again. With this, I finish. The Lord does specialize in using people who feel weak in themselves, but lean on their Lord and Savior for everyday strength. Step up in faith in Christ. Step up because you do belong. You do grow. And you do have a place to find your purpose. Let's pray.